November 4th, 1995, Tel Aviv. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin is gunned down by a young right-wing extremist at a peace rally in Tel Aviv and dies a short time later. The assassin, Yigal Amir, says he shot the Prime Minister to stop the peace process from continuing, to put an end to the Oslo Accords. For Yigal Amir and many others, the concept of land for peace, of handing over portions of the biblical land of Israel, spelled national disaster. It was treachery. In his eyes, Rabin deserved to die. It changed everything in our thoughts. And I'm sure that without being able to show exactly what was the line between, between the assassination and the peace process, I can say that it had a very big impact, maybe on our optimism. And optimism was a very important part of the process. Only optimists can, can do something like that. The assassination of Yitzhak Rabin shocked Israel and the world. There was an outpouring of support for the peace process to continue. But a series of devastating Palestinian terror attacks eroded that support. Seven months later, Rabin's successor, Shimon Peres, was narrowly beaten at the polls. The leader of the nationalist Likud party, Benjamin Netanyahu, became prime minister, pledging peace with security. Peace, yes, said Netanyahu, but not at any price. Israel stands at a crossroads. It seeks peace, but the price is high. While many are ready to cede land for peace, others are not. Israel is split on its most critical issues, peace and land. The divisions have their origins in the early years of the Zionist movement. Zionist leaders seeking to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine held radically different views on the means and purpose of achieving that goal. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, believed Zionism could only be realized by mass Jewish immigration to Palestine and the conquest of the land by Jewish labor. A socialist Zionist, Ben-Gurion arrived in Palestine in 1906 and worked first as a farmer. Ben-Gurion wrote, a land is only acquired through the pains of work and creation, through the efforts of building and settling. Zev Jabotinsky, who had created the Jewish Legion to fight alongside the British Army during the First World War, rejected Ben-Gurion's vision of the Jewish state. Jabotinsky believed in achieving Zionist goals by military force and building the country not through socialism, but by private enterprise. The youth movement he founded, Beitar, sang of creating a Jewish state on both sides of the Jordan River. At the root of the ideological conflict lay burning issues which still reverberate today. Whether to create a state by force or build it through labor. Whether to compromise with the Arabs over territory or strive for a greater land of Israel. Whether to found a society built on the principles of socialism or capitalism. With which states and powers to forge alliances. And should Israel stand alone, sometimes against the entire world, for the policies in which it believes? In the midst of the fighting of 1948, after Israel declared independence, a ship purchased by the right-wing Yirgun underground militia arrived off the Israeli coast. The Altalena was carrying arms and several hundred Holocaust survivors. David Ben-Gurion had initially agreed to allow the Altalena to land. 
But when the Irgun demanded that some of the weapons go to its own units, Ben-Gurion refused. He suspected that the Irgun, led by Menachem Begin, was planning a coup against his government. Three days later, after a tense showdown, Israeli forces opened fire on the Altalena. The ship exploded. There were several dead and wounded. Others jumped for their lives. The incident left a deep scar between the Israeli right and left. Following bitter fighting, Israel survived its war of independence and signed armistice agreements with Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. Israel quickly gained international recognition. Leading Israel was Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, the man who had steered the Jewish people to statehood, now faced the daunting tasks of building a nation, absorbing hundreds of thousands of Jewish immigrants, and defending the country. Opposite Ben-Gurion stood Menachem Begin, leader of the nationalist Chirut party. Begin was the disciple of Zev Jabotinsky. Bitter political opponents Begin and Ben-Gurion would clash again and again across the floor of the Knesset, Israel's parliament. Anyone in Israel who lived at the time will recall the acrimonious um, debates or personal attacks between the then Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion and head of the opposition Menachem Begin. When Ben-Gurion used to say again and again, yes, we will set up a, a government, but the communists and Harut are outside. They will not feature as candidates in that coalition. And this went on for a good number of years. The newly created Jewish state existed in an Arab Middle East. Its borders were awkward and it was vulnerable. Jordan. The Hashemite kingdom was ruled by King Abdallah. Abdallah had met in secret with Israeli representatives even before independence, seeking an understanding. He continued to try to reach a peaceful arrangement with Israel after the 1948 war. His efforts cost him his life. In 1951, he was assassinated on the steps of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. His young grandson, Hussein, soon took over the throne. Egypt. In 1952, King Farouk was removed from power by a military coup. Within two years, Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser had taken full control of the country. He introduced sweeping social and economic reforms. He pledged to rid the Middle East of colonialism and to unify the Arab world. Only from 1955 on, when Nasser emerged as a leader of a great pan-Arab movement, which uh, extended uh, throughout the Middle East, actually throughout the Third World, and uh, in which uh, Nasser discovered uh, a role for himself, as a great leader of a campaign against imperialism, the clash with Israel was inevitable. I was feeling threat always. I was feeling nightmare. I was feeling every night that Israel will be able to move and reach Cairo in four hours as was published in your newspapers. In 1956, Israel, together with Britain and France, invaded the Sinai Peninsula. Israel's motives were to end the threat of Palestinian raids out of Egyptian territory and to force open the Egyptian blockade of the Gulf of Aqaba. The interest of Britain and France was to act against Nasser's nationalization of the Suez Canal. For Israel, the campaign was a resounding military success, but British and French support rapidly evaporated in the face of international pressure. Within weeks, all troops were withdrawn from the Sinai. While Israel achieved its goals, President Nasser emerged a hero. He had taken on Israel and two superpowers and survived. Syria, the vanguard of Arab nationalism. Damascus dreamed of recreating the ancient kingdom of greater Syria and regaining control over the territories of Jordan, Lebanon, and former Palestine. Syria believed that efforts by the Palestinians to regain Palestine by force were not enough. The catalyst for the June 1967 war was water. When Israel diverted the waters of the Jordan River, tensions rose. There were military clashes. Syria seized the opportunity to galvanize the Arabs into a war against Israel. There must be a, a pan-Arab war against Israel. And Syria did it its best and succeeded in dragging Egypt into it and Jordan into it. Egypt was very reluctant to fight, Jordan too. Israel also didn't want the war. America didn't want the war. The Russians, they were part of it, but they were not keen 
to have a war and to have a defeat. With Syria's prodding, Egypt's President Nasser moved troops and equipment into the Sinai. The Soviet Union supported the Egyptian moves. Nasser then demanded and gained the withdrawal of all UN forces from the Sinai and reimposed the blockade on the Gulf of Aqaba. Nasser was already realizing that the revolution was a failure. He reached a dead end in, in, in all his programs, the social, economic, the, uh, the, the, the project of, of Arab unity. And he felt that if he gambles on this move and he manages to get away with it, he may restore his position in the Arab world. So it was a game of brinkmanship, of uh, taking risks, of uh, gambling. Uh, and uh, most parties did not believe that Israel will go to war. Egypt concluded military pacts with Iraq and Jordan. Jordan's King Hussein was forced into a situation of no choice. For Israelis, the days before the war were a tense, terrifying period of waiting. Many believed the second Holocaust was at hand. An aunt of my wife's was saying, if there's going to be a war, why should our children be also victims of this? Perhaps we should evacuate the children to Europe, the children of the country. Not only Israel, uh, the whole world and diaspora were very anxious, very worried. I mean, there were tremendous demonstrations of support for Israel because people thought that this was going to be, if not the second Holocaust, uh, the devastation of the Jewish state. In a move to reinstill a sense of confidence, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol appointed former Chief of Staff and national hero Moshe Dayan as Minister of Defense. The cabinet voted to create a national unity government. Opposition leader Menachem Begin joined it. The government decided on a preemptive strike against the Arabs. Early in the morning of June 5, 1967, the Israeli Air Force went into action against Egyptian bases and aircraft, completely destroying the Egyptian Air Force. Israel's preemptive attack caught the Arabs completely off guard. It was the key to a remarkable military victory. In six days of war, Israel routed the armies of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. It quadrupled its territory, extending its borders to the Suez Canal in the west, to the Jordan River in the east and the Golan Heights in the north. More than 700 Israeli soldiers were killed in combat, 2,500 were injured. Arab casualties were in the thousands. A million Palestinians living on the West Bank and Gaza Strip fell under Israeli control. The holiest Jewish site, the western wall of the Temple Mount in the heart of the old city of Jerusalem, was now in Israeli hands. Many saw the victory of the Six-Day War as divine intervention. I then did not see exactly the price we have to pay for this victory. Victories are not here coming cheap in history. You have to pay. Many, many people they are looking on this as God's hand that leads our history, something in the line of the final Geula redemption. The religious parties moved within a fortnight, in one fell swoop, from being a moderate force in Israeli politics to being the most extreme force in Israeli politics, imbued with messianic visions of this country and the tombs of our ancestors. And, 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 and all these feelings which I respect, but which cannot be a guide to a political uh, compromise with the Arab states. The Arabs saw Israel's victory as a humiliating defeat. Initial Israeli overtures of peace were rejected. Everyone in the country was a very hard defeat because, as I said, it was in no time. And we discovered that the leaders were not doing their best work or they were not doing anything. And uh, that was really, as you said, as if we were cheated, yes. In the immediate aftermath of the war, Israel proposed peace talks with the Arabs. There is a new atmosphere which will develop with the opening of uh, direct negotiations between Israel and the uh, Arab neighbors will show that many problems which today seem difficult of solution can be solved 
in goodwill and cooperation. We speak not as conquerors, but as partners with our Arab neighbors in a common region. Later that year, the Arab states vowed to continue the military struggle against Israel, pledging no peace, no recognition, and no negotiation. The Arab reaction to the war was this. We must not negotiate, they said, on the basis of the military results of the Six-Day War, because the military results of the Six-Day War totally underestimate Arab potential. We, the Arabs, are bigger, we are stronger, we are richer, we have more oil, we have more money, we have more territory. Uh, we are not represented by the failure of the war. A vacuum was created, no peace and no war. Following Levi Eshkol's sudden death, Golda Meir became prime minister, while Moshe Dayan remained as defense minister. There was a move towards settling critical areas of the captured territories. Defense Minister Moshe Dayan put it this way, if the Arabs refuse to make peace, we cannot stand still. The government must create facts, facts which included settling the territories. I think that we can wait for a call. I, I don't see anything wrong with the peasant situation. I don't know why should we approach anyone about anything. We, we, as far as I'm concerned, we are just happy as it is now. And if the others are happy, so that's it. But the others aren't going to be happy, really, oh, are they? Let, let them ring us up. We want the complete withdrawal of the Israeli forces from the occupied Arab territories in Egypt, uh, Jordan, and Syria. Nasser lost the war in 1967. By accepting a settlement, by making peace with Israel as a result of that war, he would have recognized his defeat. He would have actually um, legitimized uh, peace, which was not legitimate, had not been legitimate before that. In other words, he would have uh, uh, solidified uh, his defeat into a, an unchangeable situation. He could not accept that. And this is why he started the war of attrition, because as long as there, was, uh, there were clashes and uh, the two forces were firing at each other along the Suez Canal, he could tell his people the war is not over. We are still fighting. The war of attrition was fought across the Suez Canal. Hundreds of Israeli soldiers died in the fighting. Thousands were injured. Egyptian casualties were massive. Finally, after five Russian piloted MiGs were downed by Israeli jets, the Soviet Union urged Egypt to accept a US brokered ceasefire. Israel's acceptance of the Rogers peace proposal was unacceptable to right wing leader Menachem Begin. He quit the cabinet he had joined on the eve of the Six Day War. Menachem Begin had a problem with the uh... United Nations Resolution 242, any kind of acceptance, formal, explicit acceptance of the entirety of the clauses in that resolution, including the clause that called for withdrawal, which would have an impact on uh, Judea Samaria, was for Menachem Begin anathema. He would not be a partner to such uh, an approach. After the death of Gamal Abdel Nasser, a new leader emerged in Cairo, Nasser's right-hand man, Anwar Sadat. Sadat gave the Soviet Union marching orders to quit Egypt. Sadat forged an alliance with Syrian leader Hafez Assad. Assad was as desperate to regain the Golan Heights as Sadat was to restore the Sinai to Egypt. Sadat said he was ready to sacrifice a million soldiers to regain the Sinai. No one will capitulate here in this country. I am not ready to capitulate or to surrender one inch or a bit of sand. But Israel believed itself safe and secure. There was nothing to worry about. I have to make a decision whether to have peace by withdrawing to the old line or not to withdraw to the old line and not to have peace. I would rather have it this way keep some of the positions, even at the price of having no peace. Now, is there any reason to believe that if you maintain that position, that eventually you will not again go to war with the Arabs? There will be 
no comparison, less possibility of war if we uh, maintain these positions because these borders will be better. Saturday, October 6th, 1973. It was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. A Yom Kippur nobody in Israel will ever forget. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Egypt and Syria launched their onslaught. A massive surprise attack on two fronts caught the Israeli army completely unprepared. The inconceivable had come to pass. In the south, tens of thousands of Egyptian troops crossed the Suez Canal. In the north, Syrian troops and armor advanced on Israeli positions on the Golan Heights. Desperate fighting raged, with heavy casualties on all sides. But then the tide of war changed. The Egyptian advance was contained. Israel turned the Syrians back to the 1967 lines and then continued to push into Syrian territory. By the time a ceasefire came into effect on October 22nd, Israel had crossed the Suez Canal into Egypt. The price of war had been devastating. 2,700 Israelis killed and thousands more wounded. Thousands of Arab soldiers had lost their lives. Psychologically, we paid an unnecessary price for many years subsequently, which apparently was a kind of a sense that we had lost uh, confidence in ourselves and in our capacity to defend ourselves, or maybe even with regard to some, the justice uh, of our cause. And, uh, and I think that uh, this was exaggerated. And I think it made its impact has continued to this very day. I think the rise of a movement such as the Peace Now movement goes right back, the roots go back to those days into the loss of self-confidence and to the beginning of questioning of whether we are here by, uh, by right or just by force. Are we here, should we be here throughout the entire territory? from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. And these questions all go back to that uh, traumatic, uh, those traumatic days. U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger played a key role in securing a ceasefire between Israel, Egypt, and Syria. In December 1973, the United States and Soviet Union sponsored a Middle East peace conference, which opened in Geneva. It was a milestone in the Arab-Israel conflict, but the breakthrough was short-lived. After opening speeches, the conference adjourned. Secretary Kissinger persevered. His shuttle diplomacy between Washington, Moscow, and the Middle East paid off. Disengagement agreements between Israel, Egypt, and Syria were signed the following year. In the aftermath of the war, Prime Minister Golda Meir resigned. She was replaced by the young soldier diplomat Yitzhak Rabin. Would you possibly agree to a summit meeting between yourself and Mr. Rabin? It is impossible. Impossible. Why? Well, after 26 years of hard feelings, violence, Wars, hatred, hatred, bitterness. And then suddenly we meet. This is not logic at all. And uh, while he is grabbing our land, mind this also. Not practical. But a fundamental change had occurred in the region. The Arabs understood that Israel could not be defeated militarily. It was there to stay. Israel understood that it could not indefinitely hold all the territories captured in the Six-Day War. Historically speaking, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, something to the historians to, to decide. I believe that it contributed with a very high price to the understanding on both sides, that there is no uh, way to end it but through negotiations. The 1973 war had left Israel in a grim, somber mood. The dead and wounded, the grief and the shock of the war had taken a heavy physical and psychological toll. Attitudes changed. The settler movement gained momentum with the creation of Gush Emunim, the Bloc of the Faithful. The left had lost its sense of purpose 
that uh, typified the early Zionists who came here. And therefore, in that context, Gush Emanim saw itself as a rejuvenation of that uh, very uh, thrilling Zionist uh, venture. Others believed the time was right for a dialogue for peace. The country be began to be polarized in the Six Day War, but then came the Yom Kippur War, and the Yom Kippur War polarized it, it even further. You must remember that Gush Emunim, the settlement lobby of the National Religious Party, started blossoming after the Yom Kippur War. On the other hand, peace now and the moderates, uh, people like me, were even more reinforced in the belief that we must reach a compromise if given the chance. 1977, a political earthquake. For the first time since the establishment of the state, the founding Labour Party was defeated in national elections. Menachem Begin's right-wing Likud bloc swept to power. Labor's downfall had many causes. The failure to foresee the 1973 war, the institutional corruption and kickbacks which had involved leading labor politicians in scandal, the belief that the party would remain in power no matter what. Well, you must realize that people like me grew up in an Israel and before that a Palestine in which it was almost God-given that labor rules and nobody else rules. And it was a, 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 an emotional shock and a trauma to realize one day that Mr. Begin, uh, from a semi-outcast, political outcast, became prime minister. And many people were afraid that this was going to destroy everything that they stood for. For the Likud faithful, the victory was a hard-fought triumph long in coming. The right wing of Israel had been vindicated. To be on the right was now politically correct. The domination of the left-wing elitist establishment had been smashed. Changes had also taken place in the national religious camp. Years of state religious education had produced a new generation of Israeli youth, idealistic and religious. Menachem Begin's rise to power coincided with the coming of age of religious Zionism. His ideology of settling the territories, the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria, was the ideology of religious Zionists. Begin was embraced by the religious camp. I thought that uh, having uh, gained or regained, if you wish, those territories back, there was no question that we had to maintain our hold because uh, it meant it, it made sense. It belonged to us historically. And uh, it was, for me, uh, totally uh, beyond uh, logic to contemplate the possibility that we would again divide what we call in Hebrew Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. We, the peace camp, we say, look, we all share this sentiment, this very deep sentiment, this very strong link to the cradle of civilization. But we are realistic people. We must conduct a policy which will bring peace to Israel in the Middle East. So we must relinquish our claim in order to bring about peace to this land. In Egypt, President Anwar Sadat viewed the new Prime Minister of Israel as a strong leader with whom he might be able to reach a settlement. He began to contemplate the idea of traveling to Jerusalem and speaking directly with the Israelis to secure the return of Sinai. I don't think that President Sadat slept and rose up in the morning and said, I'm going to Israel. Meaning that President Sadat never, out of the blues, came out with the idea of visiting Jerusalem. Moshe Dayan, then foreign minister, met secretly in Morocco with Egyptian Deputy Prime Minister Hassan Al-Tohami. The two discussed the possibility of a peace settlement in which Israel would return all or portions of the Sinai in return for peace. Tohami reported to President Sadat that the Israelis were willing to withdraw from the Sinai. Sadat was further encouraged when he met with Romanian President Ceausescu, who told him that Prime Minister Begin wants a solution. The stage was set for Sadat's trip to Israel. 
The historic visit was a landmark in the annals of the Middle East. The leader of the most powerful Arab country flew directly from Cairo to Tel Aviv to speak to Israel's leaders face to face to address the Knesset in Jerusalem. It was like, as they say, like the first man who went to the moon. It was something really that everyone appreciated it, either Israeli, Jews, foreigners, Arabs, who, who love peace and who wanted to live in prosperity and peace, will never forget this decision from Saddam. But the initial euphoria of the visit soon evaporated. Sadat's speech to the Knesset was tough and uncompromising. Egypt demanded the unconditional return of the entire Sinai as a prerequisite for peace. <laughs> Menachem Begin had hoped that he could trade the Sinai in exchange for a free hand in the West Bank with a limited autonomy plan for the Palestinians. He believed that Sinai was a part of Egypt. We have not to keep it. But all of Israel, all of the land of Israel, in the biblical dimensions, belongs to Israel. In Israel, demonstrators for and against the peace process took to the streets. The Peace Now movement was established by a group of army reserve officers demanding that the historic opportunity for peace not be missed. Others viewed with trepidation the return of the Sinai and the dismantling of Israeli settlements there. I thought that the removal of these settlements will be precedent for the future for other settlements that I believe that we have to establish in various parts of the country. The process reached a point of crisis. The United States proposed that Israeli and Egyptian leaders come to the presidential retreat at Camp David to resolve outstanding issues and meet personally with President Jimmy Carter. Camp David was to be a face saver for all parties. But the negotiations were tense and difficult. At one point, the Egyptian delegation was ready to walk out. I was very surprised and shocked at the time when he called me and he said, I'm packing, I'm leaving. And I said, what, what are you saying? You said that you are, I mean, have the desire to make peace and you will make it and you decided to do this, why are you leaving? He said, well, I'm not going to quit, but I'm going to leave for another meeting again when Prime Minister Begin will be ready for it. I think the turning point came from the intervention of Mr. Carter. When President Sadat was packing, and he said, I cannot wait anymore, I cannot deal with Mr. Begin because he is insisting on such matters. Here came President Carter and really made it possible for the two leaders to come to a compromise. After maybe two hours, he called me again and he told me, well, you will be the first to know that at last uh, we will sign the peace treaty in Washington. The Camp David Accords of September 1978 paved the way for the Israel-Egypt peace treaty half a year later. The words, no more war, no more bloodshed, rang out from the White House lawn to the rest of the world. And. Sadat betrayed Assad. And in 78, the Camp David Accord, 79, the peace between Egypt and Israel, was the point where Syria decided to go out against uh, Egypt, the Egyptian uh, betrayal. Incidentally, it was not against Egypt, it was against Sadat. They always managed to separate between the leader uh, and the people. The people support the struggle against Israel, the leader, Sadat, betrayed the coast. October 1981. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat was gunned down by Islamic radicals at a military parade marking his October war. The evacuation of Sinai went ahead on schedule. Army bases were dismantled, settlements emptied out. The withdrawal was completed when bulldozers flattened the town of Yamit. 
the dream of Sinai settlement ended in a nightmare. Demonstrators resisting evacuation were forcibly pulled out of the last remaining buildings of Yamit. Clashes between Israeli and Palestinian forces in Lebanon intensified during the late 1970s and early 80s. Prime Minister Begin and Defense Minister Ariel Sharon reached the conclusion that only a massive military invasion would end the PLO threat to Israel's northern border. It was June 1982. The intention was to reach 40 kilometers. One of uh, the members, I think it was Deputy Prime Minister, asked then, uh, what about, is Beirut in the picture, and I gave an answer, Beirut is not in the picture. And Mr. Begin added, if the government will decide to occupy Beirut, the government will discuss that. When the invasion moved well beyond its stated goal of 40 kilometers, many began to question the morality of the war. My feeling there was that something snapped something which I was brought up upon at the youth movement, at school, at high school, at my military training, at the officers' training, something was snapped, and this is the national consensus. I had a feeling that the political level used me in a kind of a very political war that I didn't agree with its goals and targets and never succeeded to, uh, uh, to radiate and to broadcast the values, so to say, uh, of the war to us soldiers. <laughs> In Israel, there were massive demonstrations for and against the Lebanon war. Right-wingers accused the left of treason for not supporting the war. The left accused the government of misleading the nation. After the massacre of Palestinian refugees in the camps of Sabra and Shatila by Lebanese Falange forces, hundreds of thousands of Israelis attended an anti-war rally in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was the only place around the Middle East, maybe around the world, in which people gathered to, to, to give a moral statement. We do not want our governmental, military institutions and establishments being there without us voicing our Jewish morality was a very powerful point in the sense that many people around the world, Jews and non-Jews alike, said, thank God we have you. That's the voice of Israel. We, we for su such a long time, were waiting to hear. As the war came longer and longer and they didn't stop, and then... Um, uh, the tension, inside tension, became greater. And I think for the first time in the history of the State of Israel, which is Israel is a democracy, a, st a stable democracy, that it was an attempt by the opposition to overthrow a government that was democratically elected. At a demonstration in Jerusalem, a right-wing activist threw a hand grenade at left-wing protesters. The whole thing was very, very volatile and very violent. Then all of a the sudden, this uh, um, awful explosion. So I turn and I see somebody lies 20 meters from me. Somebody lies there. Peace Now activist Emil Greenzweig was killed. There was a government meeting. I don't know exactly what about. We heard shooting. I got uh, two notes from my secretary outside. I should come outside. But I was on the list of those that have to speak, so I didn't move. But uh, half an hour later, I went, or oh, quarter of an hour later, after I had spoken, I went out. My secretary said to me that my son was wounded by shrapnel. My father, who at the time is a minister in Begin's cabinet, which I demonstrated from the other side of the street against my father sitting over there in the room of the government dealing with the, uh, uh, with the inquiry commission re recommendations. And all of a sudden, the explosion, my father runs to the hospital and have me, I mean, emotionally, I think it was the embodiment of the entire Israeli conflict. The deep rift between Israel's right and left wings widened into a gaping chasm. 
The Lebanon War had left the country bitterly divided between the left, which sought an end to the Arab-Israel conflict through a land-for-peace formula, and the right, which rejected territorial compromise. The lack of national unity on such existential issues as peace and war, we are paying a price which, for which we're going to pay, I think, in the future, again and again. The rift became deeper still during the years of the Intifada, the Palestinian uprising. Many Israelis asked why Israel was continuing its policy of occupation. Others believed the PLO was on its knees and would soon disappear. There was a very deep moral crisis there because people ceased, Palestinians, ceased to believe that they are getting nearer to their goal, especially when they have seen the massive immigration coming from Russia, millions, millions, hundreds of thousands. For them, for the Arabs, the immigration, the Jewish immigration, is the war thing they can uh, see in the world. In 1991, Israel came under attack from Iraqi Scud missiles fired in retaliation for the U.S.-led international and Arab offensive to oust Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. In the wake of the Gulf War, the United States believed a new era was dawning in the Middle East. The success of Operation Desert Storm in removing Iraqi forces from Kuwait had created a fresh climate for exploring peace between Israel and the Arabs. The United States established tremendous credibility uh, as a consequence of the Gulf War, particularly with the states, uh, with the moderate Arab states of the Gulf and with Egypt and, and even some with Syria. Uh, and we were in a position to bring those countries to the table with Israel. It took James Baker seven months to get all the parties to the Arab-Israeli conflict to agree to attend an international peace conference, which would lead to bilateral and multilateral negotiations. On October 30, 1991, the conference convened in Madrid. It was attended by Israel, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and a combined Jordanian-Palestinian delegation. I felt that we were uh, going to reshape the map. But this was... Uh an important moment, because usually after wars, political maps are redrawn. Not necessarily borders, but alliances, relationships. This was certainly uh, one of the, the such cases. And the direct outcome of the, uh, of the Gulf War was the Madrid conference in which we had for the first time these face-to-face -face direct uh, negotiations between Israel and each of our neighbors. There was a window of opportunity, because I thought that the very fact that uh, a person was so dogmatic in his, uh, in his animosity to Israel as President Assad, was willing to come to Madrid, but beyond that, much more important, to have his delegation sit opposite us in a face-to-face -face direct negotiation without the presence of a third party. But after the ceremonies of Madrid, the talks moved to Washington, where they stalled. In 1992, Yitzhak Rabin became Prime Minister of Israel. Peace topped his agenda. Secret talks in Oslo were approved between Israel and the PLO. There had been previous contacts, but this time things were different. The big difference was that we were in power. It was in our hands to implement it. So it was not just an idea, which of course began while we were in opposition, but we were there in order to fulfill it. The original idea was not to expose Oslo. The original idea was to keep it behind the, the door, to keep it behind Washington, to keep Washington as the front, and to keep Oslo as a, as a secret for the future, perhaps, for the archives of history. Oslo became the most dramatic event in the peace process since the Sadat Initiative. But it did not heal the gaping rift between the Israeli left and right. It widened it. I think the Oslo Agreement was a mistake. It was the first time that an Israeli government agreed or believed that we can put our own security in the hands of a terrorist organization. The Oslo Agreement saved the existence of the PLO. Without it, 
Arafat would remain until this day in Tunisia. The right wing was in a state of defending its own seemingly antiquated uh, position. There was quite a lot of enthusiasm for Oslo. And this was quite surprising because here Arafat was transforming himself in the eyes of Israeli public opinion from public enemy number one to a person who shakes the hands of the Israeli prime minister. The peace process also unleashed the demonic forces of Islamic fundamentalist terror. Palestinian radicals opposed to reconciliation with Israel shattered all illusions of peace as suicide bombers detonated their deadly charges. When given an opportunity to choose between peace, which to Israel is tantamount to security, and territorial compromise, Israelis would choose peace. When they are shown or they believe that this is not so, that the Palestinians have not reformed their ways, that Hamas is conducting a war of revenge and death in our streets, then they go back to the old, clinging back to the old nationalist right-wing belief. A year after the Oslo Accords, Israel and Jordan signed a peace treaty. The ceremony took place in the Arava on the southern border between the two countries. It was a hot, windy day and the sand was flying. But that did not lessen the enormity of the moment. President Bill Clinton looked on as Israel and Jordan made peace. It's not a secret that the two leaders had met before and were in excellent relations, except they could never solve, they never could overcome the problem. Yitzhak used to come home from his meetings uh, with His Majesty King Hussein and said he wants everything or nothing and I can't give him everything, so there is nothing. Unfortunately, no case to answer, but he liked him personally very, very much. He respected him very much. Basically, there was a basic of kingship. Sign as a witness the peace treaty While peace with Jordan received broad Israeli support, the Oslo process divided the nation. The prospect and implementation of broad-scale territorial concessions horrified many Israelis. Right-wing opposition to Yitzhak Rabin intensified. He was so concentrated in his task and what in his commitment and in, in his convictions that he refused to give it too much attention. He said like this, you know, leave them alone, we'll go on, the train will go on. They will yell, the dogs will bark, and the train will go on. What he did underestimate or con completely mis misconceive was that there was a serious attempt of, Jew of uh, Jewish movements to, to uh, murder him. And he wouldn't believe it. He would not believe it that a Jew will truly try to murder him. On November 4th, 1995, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated in Tel Aviv. Had it not been for the climate of animosity to the peace, coming from the center of uh, the political map of Likud and their partners, and then going further to the outskirts of the ultra-religious, radiating out to them. I mean, it's spreading, you know, it was like spreading from a center out to the outskirts. And the center was the Likud leadership that were inciting against him day and night and calling him traitor and calling him all kinds and, and abusing the peace. I think that this uh, assault on half the population lost Labour the election. I think the fact that they branded uh, the non-left portion of the uh, electorate, including many rabbis, as uh, supporters of uh, murder created tremendous, tremendous uh, feeling of uh, anger uh, people felt, I must say that I felt this at some time, they're depriving me of the opportunity to grieve. They're doing, they're, they're depriving half the people and more the right to grieve for a slain leader.
As Israel enters its 50th year of independence, it is a nation torn between left and right. The issues of security, territorial compromise, and the quest for peace remain unsettled and unresolved. 